the Stockholm 2019 um, uh, exhibition. And uh, the reason I did that was because I thought it was a good thing to put together my personal memories and uh, my, my experiences in the Falklands and obviously in the Antarctic as well during these 30 years. Um, I have not changed much uh, on this presentation or in this presentation since I showed it in Stockholm. Yeah. So those of you who saw it there or may have seen it uh, because it has been possible to download from at least the Polar website, perhaps the Falkland website as well. Uh, apologies to those who have seen it, but I think most of you will not have seen it and certainly not have had my, my um, comments to, to the presentation. So, uh, and as Kim said, I, I would very much welcome people to uh, come with questions, comments throughout the presentation. So unmute yourself, ask your question or make a comment and then mute yourself again so that we don't have a lot of background noise. So oh, is everybody with, can they can hear me? Can they see the, the slide? And uh, so um, that's the most important thing. Kim is making thumbs up. I hope that's for everybody. <laughs> if somebody is not happy with the, the way it looks, then uh, unmute yourself and make a comment and uh, we'll see if we can change something. Ah, seems like everybody's happy. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. Um, and as you know, and, and as most of you will have experienced, stamp collecting can take over your life, either entirely or at least partially. In my case, uh, you will see how stamps and the Falklands have, have taken over my life completely. Uh, and I think that's, that's a fantastic experience to, to be able to, to uh, have a life with so much fun and friends all over the world, not least in the Falklands. Anyway, we start from the very, very beginning. As you will see, <laughs> I was born in 1959, which was then uh, 60 years before I gave the presentation at Stockholm in 2019. So that's me when I was just a tiny little baby my first summer. And of course, my dad was a stamp collector, so it all came through the genes. And uh, I always say that I started collecting stamps at the age of four, because that's when my dad gave me tweezers and a magnifying glass. And I had the opportunity to pick stamps in a big box of stamps that he had uh, lying around. So that was, just, that was the beginning of it all. And the picture down there, as you can see, is my dad and myself at approximately four years of age. Uh, as we tend to do, we collect everything and anything that we can get our hands on. So, um, but at the age of seven, I, I was, became interested in Iceland, another uh, obscure island this time in the north, but I, and I've ne still never been there. I've flown over Iceland many times, but I've ne never actually stopped there. So that's on my bucket list to do at some stage. But anyway, so that's, that's my first uh, country of love, as far as stamps are concerned. And a few years later, uh, the British Empire became uh, interesting to me. And the Falklands were part of the, the uh, colonies and countries that I collected at the time. Uh, so you could say that from then on, the Falklands have, have been with me uh, ever since. And at the age of 13, I was able to acquire a rather nice collection of Falkland stamps at a local auction here in Stockholm. And I remember the, those two stamps, the um, specimen overprinted Victoria high values were in that collection. And I had those for a long time. I don't have them anymore because my stamp collection has been reduced, but those were with me for a long, long time. And of course my interest then, uh, rose because uh, I, I really uh, became interested in the Falklands. So I started corresponding with the, with the postmaster, Henry Luxton in Stanley. And as you can see, there's a letter there for an envelope from 1974 addressed to me from 
sent by Henry Luxton. I don't have the, still have the letter. I just have the envelope, uh, but I'm sure it just said, well, these are the stamps available to, to buy and, and uh, I probably bought some as well. And of course, the first Philatelic Digest was the first Falkland Philatelic book that I bought uh, and that stimulated my interest. Um, I became a teenager at some stage, obviously, and motorbikes was part of my life. Those are two, two of the motorbikes I've had. Um, and um, cars and, and girls and other things, but the Falklands were always there in the background, always in the back of my head. So they never really left me, not even at that time. And in 1984, I participated, not physically, but as a bidder at the first proper Falkland auction. You, some of you or many of you will remember the Cecil Neild collection being sold at Harmers uh, of London. And um, I'm just showing two of the items which I acquired at that auction. Uh, uh, and uh, that's how my proper Falkland collection started, started off. Uh, so uh, that, was a, that was a nice start and a nice auction as many of you will remember. And the same year, I became a member of the study group, attended my first study group weekend in 1985. And uh, there's a little snippet from the Upland Goose with, with my new membership and my membership card from 1984. As a collector, I never throw away anything, as you can see. I keep all the rubbish. <laughs> I'm sure you, most of you are the same. And you, many of you will remember when the first edition was issued in 1988. And uh, there's a little mistake here in this presentation because since that was pre pre prepared in 2019, it said that the seventh edition will be issued in 2020. It was issued in 2020 is the correct term now, of course. And there's a picture of me uh, when I presented the first edition in 1988 and the cover of the first edition, which many of you will remember, no doubt. Right, so I had written a book about Falkland stamps, but I'd never been there. How about that? So um, I was in touch with uh, Falklands government office in London and, and arranged a trip to the Falklands in 1989. And uh, I was uh, offered a, a sponsored trip because I was considered to be a positive person for the Falklands. So uh, I think they gave me a... Uh, a journalist rate, whatever that was. I remember the, I think the actual ticket said price zero, but I did have to pay for it, but it was around, I can't remember, eight, 900 pounds, I think. And in those days, of course, we all flew with the TriStar uh, <laughs> with good and bad memories from, from that, as Stephen will recall. <laughs> Okay, so I arrived in the Falklands on the 27th of January, 1989. And below uh, there, you can see the, um, the first letter I sent, which actually was sent from Mount Pleasant only an hour after I had arrived. Uh, just a very brief message to my mother saying that I had arrived and everything was fine. And a few days later, as you can see, I also sent a card to Fred Goldberg, the um, big polo collector here in Sweden who died a few years ago, sadly. And in those days, of course, the only hotel in Stanley was the Upland Goose Hotel, which is no more, but that's where I stayed. And as you can see, I kept my invoice uh, from this day. And um, I used to, used to have many dinners at what was called Monty's Guest House, which is now Dino's Bar, well known to many of you. But in those days, it was a very, very quiet, nice little place where you could have, have a decent meal unlike now, where it's mostly uh, violence going on in that place, I think, or at least fa fairly often. I was very lucky being there because I was able to visit many of the places that you, you've only heard of. So for example, Goose Green, Darwin and Port Louis. Uh, and you have to remember in 1989, there were no roads at all except for the road between Stanley and Mount Pleasant Airport. The rest were just tracks at best. 
So to go overland, for example, to Goose Green and Darwin in those days took four or five hours. Now you drive in an hour and a half or even less. And Port Louis, which you can now go to in about an hour, I suppose, was half a day's journey across very rough ground. Uh, so that, that was really, really interesting. I didn't drive myself, obviously. So I had to hire a driver to go to Port Louis. I was able to go in the, with the old folks in one of their old people's buses to, to Goose Green and Darwin. And we went all, all the way down to the, to the um, famous bridge. Uh, again, there was no road, it was just tracks, Bodie Creek Bridge. Uh, but, and now, well, I, I don't think there's a road going there. You still have to go on a track from Goose Green down to, to Bodie Creek these days, but um, it, it was quite, quite an experience. And of course, Figus was fully operational in those days, obviously, and of course. And I was able to visit many of the, of the outer islands like Keppel Island, which is almost impossible to get to, but I was able to go there. I was also able to go to Saunders and Sea Lion, as well as Fox Bay. Little did I know what was going to happen later in life. In Fox Bay, I visited the Woolen Mill, which is now, of course, no longer, well, it, it's still there, but it's not, it hasn't been operational for 30 years or something, 25 at least. And um, the post office was located in the local store at the time, which is the building on the lower left there. And I sent a registered letter to Stanley when I was there. And there's some wool samples, which I was given uh, when I visited the, um, the woolen mill. And I, this is, life is so full of coincidences and, and uh, lucky happenings. Uh, some of you will have heard or might have heard of the Southern Star, which was a small vessel bought by the Falkland Islands government, I think. And uh, it was bought because they wanted to arrange small cruises around the islands, which is really a fantastic way to visit the small offshore islands and other places. And it only ever made one cruise. And I just happened to be in the islands at the time of that cruise and was able to join it. And uh, we had a most magnificent journey uh, on that little vessel, uh, but it was way ahead of time. I mean, if, if that had been introduced like 10 years ago, it would have been extremely successful, but it was introduced in 1989 when way before there were many tourists or visitors to the island. So it just didn't work. So they sold the vessel a few years later later after she'd been sitting at Pride Pass for a long time. Anyway, we visited Carcass, West Point, and New Island on that cruise. And uh, we even produced some ship mail, as you can see, with the ship cache there. Um, quite exciting. And, and what a fantastic trip that was. Uh, I, I'm dreaming of one day organizing a cruise around the Falklands for say a number of weeks uh, going to all the magical places which you almost cannot get to any other way than, than on, a, on a fairly small vessel. One day perhaps, we will see. And of course I was only there for three weeks, but, um, and I, I really remember when I was sitting on the TriStar flying away from the Falklands, I was wondering, will I ever return? But of course the, um, the post office in Stanley they had offered me a job uh, to be the Antarctic postman. And when I got back home, I, I thought about that. And uh, I came to the conclusion, if I didn't accept it, I would regret it for the rest of my life. So I applied for the job. I was the only applicant. And the rest, as they say, is history. So two years later, or a year and a half rather, late 1991, I joined the... Uh, James Clark Ross, the brand new uh, bass icebreaker uh, research vessel, which is just retiring now. She just left Stanley after 30 years for the last time, I think it was this week or last week. Uh, and uh, I was on the maiden voyage. And uh, as you can see from this map, we, um, 
we did go along the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, we did go to Faraday, which was one of the British bases in those days, Rothera, and Sydney. Uh, and um, that was an absolutely amazing uh, journey to be in, on a bass ship going to these different British Antarctic Survey uh, bases. So as you can see, there is the ship and there is the little postcard I produced before the voyage. And of course, uh, I just had to guess how and where we, we would be going on, on the postcard, but um, in the end, we didn't all go that way that I had marked on, on the map here uh, because the ice situation was quite bad that year. So um, uh, we had to go in a different way. And um, as I said, we visited three bases and there were three different stamp sets issued. Uh, and as the postmaster or Antarctic postman, I had to cancel all the first day covers and all the philatelic mail, as well as the commercial mail, which is very little. It's just little base mail that, that uh, people in the bases send. Faraday, as it was then, and uh, you will know that I discovered this pack bow marking that they had at Faraday, which was previously unknown. And we also introduced this new postmark, uh, which is called F15. And at Rothera, uh, they were so grateful when we arrived because they were virtually out of fuel for the airplanes. And, and they have an airstrip, as you can see, they can fly uh, with in those days, I think they flew twin otters. Now they fly twin otters and dash sevens and dash eights and all sorts of things. In those days, they just had twin otters. And they were so pleased that we brought fuel that we were all given a jolly in the planes. So um, flying over Antarctica and one of those small planes to various little islands and, and deserted bases was another amazing experience. And at Sydney, uh we we arrived there at the, at, at the last uh visit and um, that's when another problem arose uh with the uh, postmarks we were delayed because of of the of the very difficult ice situation so uh we didn't get there until i think the 5th of january 1992 and of course, uh, there was a lot of base mail going out. And our journey, our visit was going to be very, very short because we were delayed. So they had a lot of base mail, which needed to be postmarked. So I got a message from the base commander saying, I don't have a 92 year, year slug. What should I do? And of course, I had the 92 year slug with me, but he wanted to process all the mail before I arrived. So we could just pick it up and basically leave. So I said, well, that's not a problem. Use a two instead of 92. So there, that's the proper story why that situation happened. We were delayed and they didn't have the 92. So it was a proper and commercial, genuine emergency. So the following year, I returned to be the Antarctic postman and the Bransfield that year uh, was going down to Halley, uh, which of course is all the way down at the bottom of the Weddell Sea. And again, it was a very hard ice year, very difficult ice year. So basically all of this was full of very, very thick pack ice or solid ice. So from the Falklands, we went to Signe in the South Orkneys. Then we had to go all the way around here and then sneak in along the coast to be able to go into Halley. And at one stage, I think we were closer to South Africa than anywhere else up here. I think we were closer to South Africa than any, any, any other part of the world. So that was a long journey uh, and quite boring to, to be through this ice week after week, but um, we managed in the end. So, um, <clears throat> On the way, we actually passed through the South Sandwich Islands. We didn't stop there, but I was able to take a couple of pictures of the islands in the distance in the, in the fog. Uh, and um, that's as close as we got. 
In Halley, I issued two sets of stamps. No, sorry, this is in Sydney, I issued one set of stamps. The other one was at Halley. And Halley 5 was the brand new base in those days. Uh, and uh, that was the first base that they were, was, they were going to be able to jack up and keep above the ice. All the previous bases had disappeared into uh, the ice shelf because it's, it slowly sinks into the shelf. But Halley 5 was on stilts, so they could jack it up every year so that it, it stayed above the ice. And of course, old Halley 4, which used to look like this, that's a postcard from uh, the 1980s, I guess. This was all we could see when I got there. So that's, that's the two towers you can see here. And they've added and added and added on top staircases and ventilation uh, uh, shafts on top there. So this was all that was visible on top. And the entire base was deep under the ice. It was like 10, between 10 and 20 meters down. And you went through this staircase and you can see the walls bulging in from the ice pressure on the outside. So it's quite scary. And I was one of the last people actually to go down into Halley 4 before it was closed down entirely and sealed off. But of course, I was able to get some last Halley 4 mail, uh, as you can imagine, as the, as the pure philatelist I am. So. Um, that was good fun. On the way back, we were very lucky. Is at the bass station on Bird Island had, uh, no, I think I, actually we went, we were redirected to Bird Island to pick up rubbish uh, because they had accumulated a lot of rubbish that had to be taken out and we, we were redirected there. But the reason why we went to South Georgia was because at the bass base at Husvik Harbor, one of the members had uh, a toothache and we had a dentist on board the ship. So that's how it works there. They sent us to, to South Georgia to sort, sort out this, this toothache. So first Bird Island and then to Husvik Harbor. Uh, and of course, in those days, we were allowed to walk around everywhere. Uh, not like now when everything is out of bounds and you're not allowed to go anywhere, but we could do anything we wanted there, basically go into the old whaling station, pick up, documents and, and whatever was lying on the floor. And there was no, no proper post office uh, there, but they did have a cache, which was applied on the, on the outward mail saying Husvik Harbor uh, Station, British Antarctic Service, South Georgia. But it, that mail was always taken to the Falklands and, and then uh, stamped with Falkland stamps and postmarked in Stanley. So uh, that's, that's as, as good as it gets. Anyway, that was the uh, Antarctic postman trip. So um, in December 93, uh, was an, there was time for another visit. This time I, I had a reason to go because uh, I had been offered to buy uh, a, a major Falkland collection in Buenos Aires. So I flew to Argentina and then <coughs> down to um, Chile, Punta Arenas. And um, I was on this, Tiny little plane, the Twin Otter, that used that Twin Otter that used to fly between Punta Arenas and Stanley, uh, which was an interesting trip because that's way out of range for, for a small plane like that. So they'd fitted it with extra fuel tanks. So half the passenger compartment was a big fuel tank. And you could see uh, the, from the pipes, there was drops of fuel dropping down, big signs of no smoking, no smoking. And then you could, you could see in front in the cockpit, the, the pilots were sitting with big Havana smoking. So uh, that's how security is in, in or was in, in Chile in those days. But we managed to get there. Not a problem. And of course, uh, I had the pleasure of staying with Stephen and Christine Palmer in the deanery. Uh, had a wonderful time there, as every time in the, in the old deanery with Stephen and Christine. That's, that brings good memories to many of us, no doubt. Uh, the only snag with that old deanery was the, the bedroom that I was always given was very cold. It was in the south western corner of the house. The sun never entered the windows and it was about 10 
degrees uh, in the morning in that room when you woke up. So <laughs> a hot bath was always uh, welcome. For a night in that bedroom it's from the previous day, Red Cross cover, as you can see. Nicely dressed to me, care of the deanery. I'm sure Stephen was uh, uh, involved in arranging that. <laughs> and I'm wrong. That's the year when they broke um, with the ships. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, this is the endurance. And that's the correct text here. But this was the first edition of the of the envelopes. And you can see that's the picture of the endurance. But it says James Clark Ross. So they had to scrap the first printing of these envelopes and, and uh, rush uh, second bonus one where you have the, the James Clark Ross picture and it says HMS Endurance, but they also corrected that one. So so in the end, they were right. But um, Stephen managed to get a few of these and very kindly gave me one of each. So <laughs> that's a good memory. And um, that's this year I was able to visit Nut Cartmel, the well-known stamp collector in Goose Green. Uh, I always, uh, I also was able to go to Pebble Island, Port Howard, San Carlos, and return to Fox Bay, and that's when I took this picture of the, the old post office, uh, mm. which, in a very deep way. And then the January '95 was the next visit, and we arranged the stamp exhibition again, thanks to Stephen's good contacts with David Tatham. Uh, who is a good friend of ours, of course, and still is. Um, and um, we were able to arrange a stamp exhibition at Government House, uh, partly with uh, some stamps and covers that I had brought, and partly with uh, some of the artwork that I had sorted for the um, Stanley Post Office, artwork for, for the stamps they had issued over the last 30 years, 30, 40 years. So that was all brought out, or part of it was brought out to the big room in Government House. And we had a wonderful uh, exhibition there with lots of locals who came and enjoyed that. So that was a good, a really good happening. And as you can see, it was um, reported in the Tiberi Express of the time. And you can, you, you will, you've seen me with a jacket. Hi, that's not very often you see that. <laughs> Do the proper thing, I guess. And that's David Tatham in the, in the background there. And I was able to visit another few places I hadn't been to before, Weddell Island, Dunbar and Hill Cove. Uh, uh, and of course at, at Hill Cove, I stayed with the Blakes, which Stephen was talking about um, earlier, earlier today at the meeting. Uh, at the big house at Hill Cove. Uh, and that, that was uh, one of my disappointments in, in uh, my Falkland life. The, for, the, the morning after I had arrived, I was supposed to go windsurfing with the son of the Blake family. And he had several windsurfing boards. And uh, I was really looking forward to that. The next morning it was dead calm. And that happens about one or two days a year at Hill Cove. So there was no windsurfing. And I've never windsurfed in the Falklands subsequently. I guess I have to do that one day, but um, just have to wait for the right winds and, uh, <laughs> and the right time. Uh, this was the, uh, the last time I flew with a TriStar. And the reason for that was that it had a breakdown. Uh, well, it didn't have a breakdown so that we had an emergency of some sort, but when we landed on Ascension going north, uh, we all realized that there was something wasn't quite right because they didn't reverse the jet engines, uh, just use the foot brake, if you like, to get the, the plane stopped. So um, there was a problem with the reverse thrust in the jet engines, so they had to fly in spare parts for that. 
and the spare parts were in Scotland. But they didn't have a plane in Scotland to fly the parts down. They had a plane in the Middle East. So they had to fly a plane in from the Middle East up to Scotland, pick up the parts, fly them down to Ascension, and fit the parts into our plane. So we had three days on Ascension, uh, which I suppose is rather nice. Uh, it's sunny, it's warm, there was a swimming pool, and uh, everything was supplied and all the rather basic because these were the, the, the this was the accommodation built for stranded passengers up in the military base. Uh, but it was it was okay, but uh, not when you wanted to go home, I suppose. So anyway, that was when I decided, no, I'm not going to fly with the TriStar anymore. I've had enough of those. So um, some other things happened in my life uh, in between. Uh, I was still building my Falkland stamp collection or postal history collection as it was then. And I had started exhibiting it uh, at various stamp exhibitions all over the world. Uh, and um, one of them was the uh, Ilsa Pex exhibition in South Africa in 1998. And I was completely surprised when I was awarded a large gold medal and the International Grand Prix. Uh, that was almost an impossibility for, for anybody to get for Falklands. Even a gold medal was virtually impossible to get for Falklands. But there you see, if you just struggle enough and uh, persist, you will be rewarded. So I was happy, as you can see on those pictures but very, very surprised. And the year after that, or rather in uh, Stampix 2000, my collection was awarded the Prix d'Honneur and Harmer's Diamond Jubilee Trophy. So um, another rather nice accomplishment. And by then, of course, the Falklands had been accepted as an important area in the philatelic world and in the exhibition world. So. Uh, before that, it had just been considered to be uh, some small islands down in the South Atlantic of, of very insignificant importance from the philatelic point of view, but we all know better, don't we? And of course, this is the most famous of all the Falkland covers I ever had, the only known cover with Falkland Islands number one, which used to be in Ken Clough's collection, and uh, which I then had in my collection for a number of years before it passed into other people's hands. 2002 was my next visit to the Falklands. Actually, it wasn't really a visit to the Falklands. It was another Antarctic visit. And that was because we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Swedish polar explorer Otto Nordenskjöld's expedition in 1901 to 1903. So this was a centenary ex expedition. And we had been able to uh, rent this former Swedish government icebreaker Nord for that trip. And uh, we were able to go to all the famous places of that expedition, including Paulet Island and Snow Hill Island. And of course on Snow Hill, this is the original house where Otto Nordenskjöld and his men lived for two years or two winters, I should say. And that's, that house has been restored uh, or was restored in the 1980s, 90s. Uh, so it's actually in better condition than when it was built. And um, so that was one of the places in the Antarctic I really, really wanted to visit. So that was a dream come true in many ways. And of course, I was the um, assistant postmaster and Fred Goldberg, our famous polar collector, was the proper postmaster. There we are, just outside the house of Snow Hill. And we opened the first and only ever Swedish post office in the Antarctic. It was open for one day only. But we had a special postmark, as you can see, it does say Snow Hill Island. Uh, and uh, I can't remember how many thousands of, of covers we postmarks. You can see the boxes. It was just a few of the boxes that we had to do there. So uh, we were quite, kept quite busy. And that's the postmark that we used, post Snow Hill Antarctica. And because there was no, never a guarantee that we would be able to go to Snow Hill Island, which is very normally very difficult to get to because of ice. Uh, uh, this year, the ice situation was very good. So we, we just cruised right through. We only had a little bit of pack ice 
but no problems whatsoever. But in case we hadn't been able to go to Snow Hill, the Swedish post office had produced an, an alternative postmark, just saying the Weddell Sea, Antarctica. Uh, well, we never used that. So these are the only impressions, proof impressions of that postmark. Uh, so um, I wasn't even aware of it until Fred Goldberg showed it to me years later and said, well, just in case we hadn't been able to go there, this is what we would have done. So he did just made a few, few proof impressions of it. We also visited Hope Bay. And uh, of course, there is the Argentine post office there and the old stone hut where, where part of the Swedish expedition stayed. And uh, we went to Deception Island, South Shetlands. And uh, some of you have been there. Some of you have gone swimming. We had minus 2.4 degrees centigrade in the water. And then you say, how, how is that possible? Water freezes at zero. Well, it's, there's a bit of salt in the water, so it doesn't actually freeze until sort of minus three, minus four. So I was able to have a proper swim in that water in, in, on Deception Island. Um, and it helped that the friend on uh, ashore had a bottle of whiskey. So you could have a tot before you jumped in and another tot when you came back up. So that was good fun. And of course, 2009 was my next visit. Uh, this time uh, I was able to get on a, what you would call a photographic expedition to South Georgia only. So a full month basically around South Georgia. Uh, and we were able to circumnavigate the entire island, land in 18 different locations, including all the old whaling stations. So that was another dream trip for me. To, to go to all these fantastic whaling places in South Georgia. And there are just a few examples here, of Prince Olaf Harbor, Leith Harbor, Strumness, and Gritviken. Of course, Gritviken I'd never been to before because last time I was in South Georgia, I only went, only went to Bird Island and Husvik Harbor. But this time I was able to go get to Gritviken. <coughs> so um, that was a really nice experience. And the post office, of course, we sent some mail. Here's one that I sent to Frank Mitchell, bless him, uh, from King Edward Point. And uh, on the way back, we had a little time uh, left. So we were able to get to, to Steeple Jason Island, another place I'd really wanted to go to for a long, long time. So I climbed up to the top of the mountain on, on um, on Steeple Jason and took these pictures. And you can see that down there is, is our little expedition trip. Uh, it was quite a miserable day, actually. It rained in the morning and it was rather gray, but these pictures came out very good. So it doesn't look as bad as it was. And after this trip, I actually disembarked on, uh, on Carcass Island believe it or not, uh, because the ship was going back to, uh, or was going to Ushuaia, I think. But I didn't want to go to Argentina. I wanted to stay in the Falklands. Uh, so I, I skipped, I jumped trip on Carcass Island and uh, then went uh, to stay for some time. And of course, by now, the new roads had all been completed. So it was a totally different situation. Uh, I was able to drive around or we were able to drive around uh, on, over to West Falkland using the ferry, which is absolutely fantastic. Those of you who haven't been there yet, that ferry has changed life in the Falklands, especially for West Falkland, uh, and makes life so much easier. Uh, so um, that really is a blessing. And I was joined by the family for Christmas. They all came down uh, and we were able to Go to my good friend Derek Peterson and, and his lovely wife Trudy out at Volunteer Point and stay there. And as you can see, here's a picture of the kids. Casper was then six years old. He's now 17 and longer than I am, taller than I am. And Michelle is now 21 and lives uh, or studies in a, in a town uh, 300 kilometers west of Stockholm now. So just I talked to her earlier today. So. Um, they have grown. 
a bit since then. <laughs> the National Stamp Collection, you will all remember this fantastic project that we were able to complete together uh, with a fully complete collection of Falkland stamps from 1878 up until the year 2000, which was then donated to the National Trust in Stanley. That was quite an achievement and uh, many of you were involved in that and donated stamps. Uh, so it was really a, a joint effort and a fantastic uh, effort, which is very much appreciated in the Falklands. Uh, and it's on now on permanent display in the museum with an iPad on top of it. So you can know where every page has been photographed. So in that iPad, you can flick through the entire collection and see every stamp issued. Uh, and there's also another iPad in the Post Office Museum at Fox Bay with the same uh, pictures of the National Stamp Collection. So what happened in 2012? Well, I'd been thinking about crazy idea to change my middle name to Falkland. And of course, in Sweden, that's quite easy to do. So, and I'd been thinking about doing that for 10 years and I, I decided to do it. And it wasn't a problem, but uh, Rochellis, my, my then wife said, she'd always known that I was crazy and this just confirmed it. Yes, I am crazy about the Falklands. So now my name, as you know, is Stefan Falkland Hates. And 2014, a new chapter started when Hugh and I started to go to regularly to the Falklands. And um, this first journey uh, in 2014, we uh, volunteered to help with the move of the old museum in Stanley to their new premises in the dockyard. Uh, we were complete volunteers. We didn't get anything. We had to pay our flights ourselves and our, our stay and food and everything. But um, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to do something like this. So we were happy to do it. And I'm sure Hugh will agree that it was very much enjoyable. And uh, we even bought a vehicle, traveled all over East and West Falkland, including Port Stevens. We were invited to government house to celebrate the queen's birthday. And we were even interviewed on Falkland Islands TV, as you can see there. And then 2014, the old post office at Fox Bay came on the market. Nobody was interested in buying it, so except me. So um, I can't say that it was an easy journey to get all the paperwork with the special permits and everything I had to have. Uh, I think it went back to the lands committee three or four times before they could accept me as a buyer of the property. And this is the actual deed uh, for, the, for the property. And I've decorated with some stamps just to, <laughs> just to use some stamps fiscally which of course is no longer the case, but uh, you can do whatever you like in the Falklands, so it's not a problem. So this basically empty house that I had bought had to be furnished and fitted out with everything you need, like uh, kitchen appliances, stove, fridge, freezer, washing machines, and so on. And that's not easily available in the Falklands. So I had to source it all in the UK ship it down by container and then have it delivered to Fox Bay. Now that's not an easy thing to do, uh, but it was military precision with all this. Everything worked perfectly. And 10 minutes after Hugh and I have arrived in the house came our lorry full of our stuff. How about that for something that's been traveling for a couple of months from the UK all the way to Fox Bay by, by ship and by lorry and being transship between all these different uh, things and it arrives just like clockwork. Fantastic. You will have seen a lot of this, but um, I just, I'll just do it briefly. Uh, the house was in very poor condition. Fortunately, the roof was fine, uh, but the outside looked really scruffy as you can see on these pictures. So, uh, and there were some hideous extensions which had to be removed. And of course, our old vehicle, which we, which we had bought the previous season, came to be very handy. So 
Uh, we use that to, as you can see, it's very full of stuff. And we've never, never traveled from Stanley to Fox Bay with an empty vehicle. They've always been completely full every time. Uh, uh, so um, that's how it went. And uh, as soon as we got there, we had to start rebuilding, tearing down, restoring, uh, painting, and everything you can imagine with an old house. But after many weeks of hard work, it started to look quite better. This was before and after, and the, uh, the backside before and after. It's a little bit of an improvement, I would say. And the, um, what used to be the old post office was converted into the post office museum. Uh, which was fun. And I had brought a lot of things with me because that was the plan initially. So all, all, basically all the things that you see here on the walls I had brought with me. Uh, we did find a, a, a counter to use as a post office counter. We found the old safe lying in the garden. There was all, and the old pigeonholes were in the old store. All that was brought to the museum uh, and is now on display. And the following year, we took care of the outbuildings. The old Nissan hut looked like that. Now it looks like this. The old garage used to look like that. And it is now like this. So we've been trying to take care of everything uh, as, as best we can. And of course, 2016 was the year when we had the royal visit. Princess Anne came out. And uh, she and her husband, they, they were extremely interested in the museum and all the artifacts and things. They asked so many questions and they signed the visitor's book and uh, she was delighted to post the first postcard ever into the newly erected old pillar box outside. So that was an, a really uh, very exciting uh, happening. And 2016, we also had this uh, problem with postmarks again, when they ran out of year slugs. So both Fox Bay and Mount Pleasant didn't have any 2016 slugs in their postmarks. So they changed them by manuscript from 2015 or 2010 to, to 16. Uh, but this was only done for a few days because when the Stanley Post Office learned about this, they stopped that practice. So I have a few of each, but... Um, very few were produced. And then in the end of the season, we had this one day postmark uh, saying the old post office Fox Bay, uh, which was good fun. 2017, we took more care of the interior of the house, adding more items to the museum. And we converted some of the sheds into bedrooms in the house, as you can see. And uh, an old peat stove was installed. It's decorative though. It's not, it's not actually in, in, in working order, but it looks nice in the kitchen. And we divided the huge bathroom into three separate units and started taking care of fireplaces, which had all been boarded over and, and looked horrible. But now they are, they're not in working order, but they are in nice uh, visual condition. And that year, they'd also introduced a new postmark, and you will have these SID postmarks, which they're called self self inking devices, uh, with the I don't know how many how many size there are twelve size on these postmarks are there or something like that, uh, both at Fox Bay and Mount Pleasant, and of course the National Stamp Collection came on permanent display in the museum in Stanley. So uh, that was another good year. And 2018, more interior work, redecorations, and a total renovation of the heating system at Fox Bay and several new radiators installed. So it's, it does look rather smart now, I think. We have um, done rather good with that. And um, some swimming, fishing, um, which is good fun. I even managed to get you to swim a couple of times. Not very often, but um, it happens. Reluctantly, does it. 
And um, we also discovered that year, we discovered these Figus lab freight labels, which nobody knew of, the, known of, the, the um, reprint, which had been done in, what was it, 2011? And we didn't find out about that until 2018, I think it was, or 2017 or 2018. So that was quite, quite an amazing thing because the, the, um, the previous ones had just been 10p, 20p and pounds but the new ones had added 50 P's and two pound values. So that was quite exciting. And 2019, the last year that I will show here, my, my famous Porsche Cayenne, which uh, Hugh and I bought in the UK and we shipped it down to the Falklands and it had proven to be a fantastic four by four off-road vehicle. I've only managed to get bogged, properly bogged once. And boy, did I get bogged then. Uh, but um, that, that, that happens to everybody. And I'm now pleased to say that I have been properly bogged in the Falklands, which was a first for me. But that vehicle has been absolutely fantastic and still is. So uh, a little bit more work in the house that year, insulating the loft and swimming in the sea, of course. And the, the um, stamp issue to comm commemorate the 100th anniversary of the old post office in Fox Bay. Um, and um, that took quite some lobbying to do to get that into being, but it was good fun. And um, now we've put the um, post office museum on stamp. So um, what else can be done? What will happen over the next 30 years? Well, nobody knows, but you can be certain that the Falklands will continue to be a major part of my life. And that's it. Thanks very much.